And we have Hector Hutin, the Ecole Normale Supérieure de Lyon. So please go ahead. Hi. So we have first, uh, thank you to the organizer for allowing me to present this work uh, today. So uh, what I'm going to talk to you to talk about today is uh, about how we can use a qubit to answer a question that has more than two outcomes uh, and eventually uh, take that as an example, um, the continuous monitoring of a cavity photon number. And uh, my slides are already stuck. Oh, it's working now. So uh, what we want to do is uh, with a harmonic oscillator, for example, a microwave cavity, uh, we want to uh, count uh, how many excitations there are in the, this uh, microwave oscillator. So to do that, we use a qubit uh, that we couple uh, in the dispersive regime uh, capacitively to, the, to, this, uh, to this oscillator. And uh, we, so we will have this chi, uh, which is the, uh, the, the, the frequency shift of the qubit each time we add uh, a photon into the resonator. And uh, if uh, we, the chi is sufficiently high, uh, we are in the number resolved regime and uh, we have a well-resolved uh, frequency resonance uh, for every number of photons into the resonator. So uh, one can, for example, conditionally excite uh, the qubit uh, depending on the number of photons uh, into the, the resonator. So uh, the way it, it, it's been done uh, already it's, uh, as I said, for example, a conditional excitation of the qubit, uh, and then by, well, the qubit, uh, then we will encode the inform uh, one bit of information into the qubit, and we can use, so then the qubit is used as a pointer to retrieve uh, one bit of information by reading out the state of the qubit. The qubit will answer one or zero, yes or no. And, uh, for example, uh, one can uh, successively interrogate every resonant frequency of the qubit and eventually get, uh, finally, are there three qubits? And the answer would be yes, and we would be happy. Obviously, uh, there are more uh, subtle ways of asking questions to the qubit. One can, for example, extract the, the, the decomposition of uh, the number of photons in the base two by uh, extracting by, bit by bit. It has been done... Uh, so uh, in, um, in, uh, with the Rydberg atoms and also in superconducting circuit. And uh, the method I'm uh, proposing now is uh, to ask, to probe actually the, the fluorescence of the qubit and uh, by asking simultaneously to, uh, by uh, asking simultaneously at every frequency, uh, possible frequency of the qubit, uh, what is the, the state, what is the resonant frequency of the qubit? So, Eventually, uh, we send this drive. The qubit will react and emit fluorescence at one frequency. And then uh, the, 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 the response to our question will be encoded into the propagating state of the transmission line. So then uh, this is a significant difference in the way we use the qubit. We we'll use the qubit as an encoder to encode the information on the number of photons in the storage into uh, the propagating mode of the transmission line. So the new pointers here are the modes that we have to interrogate to get the number of photons. And this corresponds to a frequency division multiplexing. It corresponds to asking all the questions all at once at the qubit. Uh, and this has uh, previously been done in, uh, in my group by Antoine Essig, uh, who was published in 2021. Um, yeah, so um, why this has not been done before? It's because uh, to perform this measurement, one needs an amplifier that has a high quantum efficiency because uh, uh, fluorescence of a qubit is essentially a one photon signal, but this is, this is very weak. And uh, this needs to be broadband so we can uh, amplify at the same time all the, the possible frequencies of the qubit. Uh, so this is the, the setup we will use here with heterodyne measurement. We send all the frequencies we want to, to, uh, to, to, to use to ask uh, questions to the qubit. Then it will be reflected by the qubit. We will amplify it with uh, the two pi. Here it's a two pi of the, the Lincoln lab. And um, then uh, we can uh, ask uh, all our questions to, uh, I mean, is, it, is the fluorescence at F0, F1, or F8 uh, by, uh, by demodulating the signal at the right frequency and integrating it? It's a classical setup, uh, heterodyne detection uh, setup. 
So uh, what already has been done in our group, it, uh, it was embedded in, uh, into a 2D chip. So it was a uh, uh, Coplana WaveGuard resonator here, the, the, the storage that was coupled to the multiplexing qubit uh, in orange. And, uh, and the, 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 the multiplexing qubit was very coupled. You see it has a, a T1 of 42 nanoseconds, which is necessary if you want to retrieve a, a, sin a signal that is as bright as possible. And uh, we could uh, retrieve the, the Poisson law uh, as a mean uh, with this first multiplex quantum measurement uh, by looking at every um, um, coefficient of reflection at every frequency. But uh, this was only as a mean. The, the T1 of the storage was of four microseconds, which was too low to, to be able to be single shot. I mean, by the time we measure the, the number of photons, the resonator uh, would have lost all its photons, so it, it, uh, we can do better. And now I'm going to explain to you how we can do better. So what are the parameters we want to improve? Um, so we have the, the, the storage that is coupled by Cal to the, to the qubit. The qubit is coupled uh, by um, 1 over its T1 uh, to the transmission line. And we want the T1 of the storage as high as possible, the, the, the T1 of the qubit as low as possible uh, to, to have a, a, a high uh, uh, bright signal. And uh, we want the chi between the two to be as high, uh, sufficiently high to be in the normal result regime. Uh, but the problem with this setup is that uh, if we don't pay attention, the coupling between the storage and the qubit will give rise to a natural decay of the storage through uh, uh, an hybridization between the two modes and the, the storage will be, will be decaying because the, 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 the qubit is very coupled to the transmission line. Uh, so to avoid that, uh, we put a filter. We have to put a filter uh, uh, on the line that would reflect the, the, the excitation of the storage and keep the storage with a high T1 and let go through the ones of the qubit. So this is really analogous. I mean, it's the same principle as the personal filter, but instead we want to protect the cavity and uh, not protect the qubit, which is the exact opposite of uh, what, uh, what we do uh, usually. Um, and uh, the uh, design we came up with, so it was uh, Antoine's design, is this one. So uh, for the high T1, we want, it's better to have a first a high uh, bare T1. So we took a post cavity in aluminum, uh, in a 3D cavity. Uh, to, and uh, then uh, to be very coupled to the qubit, uh, the, what we managed to do, and that is really the key point uh, that makes this uh, setup work, is uh, the fact that we have here the transmission line that is galvanically coupled here through a pad in a tantalum. So this is a tantalum and sapphire uh, for, the, for the fabrication. And uh, this galvanic uh, coupling makes this uh, pad of tantalum uh, with the, the aluminum uh, like uh, a 50 ohm um, transmission line at the frequency of the qubit, and that, that will end very close to the qubit here with its antenna, it's a transmon, actually, a transmon qubit. And uh, so the, the, here we really have the end of a, a 50 ohm transmission line with almost no parasitic reflections, thanks to uh, the pogo pin uh, that I will show a picture later. That allows you to, that allows us to have this, uh, this very high, uh, this uh, galvanic coupling. And uh, on top of that, we need the filter, and the filter is here. It's uh, called the uh, spur lines. And uh, this is uh, this shape here that allows us to have a, a, a very good stop band uh, um, filter that allows us to have these figures for the, for the, for the, the qubit on the storage. Uh, 25 nanoseconds for the, for the lifetime of the qubit and one millisecond at 4.5 gigahertz for the storage. So actual pictures of the device, we have our post cavity here. There is a tunnel here in which we can insert uh, the, the chip here uh, so that the, the, the qubit, uh, we can see the, 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 the transparent qubit here. The other here is, the, is a, an antenna of another qubit that is here for Wigner measurement. I won't talk about it uh, here. And we have the pogo pin uh, that enters through this hole here. And you can see here, uh, this is a pin that is, uh, there is a, a spring on it, and it allows us to have this contact even at 20 millik. Uh, obviously, uh, we need something to make this hold uh, on the sample, but it was for illustration purpose, so I, I just let it a bit uh, off, uh, but you, 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 you can see the principle. 
And uh, the measure T1 we obtained was of 250 microseconds. Uh, and this is only limited by the dielectric losses uh, at the interface of the sapphire and the tantalum. So the, 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 the Purcell filter uh, works very well, uh, <coughs> very well. So now what about the qubits? Are we well coupled to it? Uh, sorry, uh, first uh, a few notations. So it's just for the, for the setup. We send, uh, we, we send a pulse here, uh, uh, A in and I out. We, what we retrieve is actually uh, the mean value of these uh, annihilation uh, operators. And uh, what we do is uh, we demodulate, we really demodulate and integrate uh, over a, delta, a period delta t. Uh, so to measure uh, the performances of the qubit, we send just on the qubit line a pulse that is reflected by the qubit. And, to, and we managed to have, uh, to see actually Rabi oscillations of the, of, the, of the qubit. So you can see, uh, we can see them because the, the input-output theory gives you this relationship. So on top of the reflected signal, uh, you will have uh, the input signal plus uh, the mean value of sigma minus, which corresponds in our case to just the mean value, uh, if we take the real part, the mean value of sigma x and the qubit just goes this way, and we see this oscillation of sigma x that, is, uh, that we can retrieve from the signal. And by fitting uh, the steady state at every uh, amplitude and frequency, one can uh, extract the T1 and the T2 of the, the qubit. So we have uh, 24 nanoseconds qubit uh, on the T2 that is uh, more or less limited by 2T1 uh, because uh, we manage to, uh, to usually to have much higher uh, uh, um, much lower, um, much high, uh, lower gamma phi for, for the qubit. Um, the histograms now, uh, so what did we manage to do with that? Uh, so the, the first sequence is as follows. We displace the cavity, and then uh, we integrate the signal you just saw, but over 20 uh, microseconds. And uh, this gives you a point in the IQ plane. And uh, if you are uh, off resonance, it's just a Gaussian in the IQ plane. If you are off resonance, you have two main blobs, the blobs corresponding to there is zero photon into the cavity, in the cavity, and the blobs corresponding to uh, there are not zero photon in the cavity. Same uh, if, we, if you are at uh, F1 corresponding to one photon and F2 corresponding to two photons. So seeing that gives us confidence that we might be single shot because 20 microseconds is still quite small compared to the 250 that we managed to, to get. Um, so a, a small animation uh, to show you the, the blobs uh, going around the, the, the resonance circle. Uh, uh, and, 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 I mean, and we see uh, that we are uh, success, uh, successively resonant uh, with every, frequency, every possible frequency of the qubit. Uh, but uh, from this, we can also plot a theta. Uh, I mean, we extract the, the theta angle of every, every point and uh, reconstruct a density probability for the theta at every frequency we, we probe, and we manage to have this uh, on a log scale, uh, all the resonance, the possible resonances of the qubit uh, successfully at, uh, uh, su successfully on the density probability, which allows us to extract a chi, which is 5.2 megahertz. Now that confirms that we are, it's the limit, but we are still in the number result regime. Um, now what we can do is, uh, ask successfully the question, uh, many times the question, are there zero photons, are there zero photons, are there zero photons uh, for um, uh, here uh, until 1.6 uh, seconds. And uh, we see uh, that uh, most of the time there are zero photons if we don't, if we don't touch uh, the, the storage. And sometimes because of thermal excitation, we can see puff uh, in yellow green, uh, the, the thermal excitation of the qubit arising and leaving the leaving the storage, so, the, the, uh, so we, we are indeed single shot if you send a single tone. But uh, what we want to do is to send multiple tones to have all the, que the question and all the answer at the same time. So what, to do that, uh, it's actually simpler to consider just an infinite comb on both sides of the resonance, even if uh, there is no possible resonance at this frequency, we just extend uh, the comb uh, with uh, frequency spacing chi and uh, we send it to the qubit and we will see uh, what happens. So first, we just apply a strong star shift drive to see uh, just without qubit what happens. So we just push the qubit out of the resonance. And uh, what we see in time is also 
a comb, which is uh, normal because the, the Fourier transform of, the, of a comb is also a comb. And here we had, uh, it's not an infinite comb, we have like, uh, 20 teeth of the comb. So the wiggles here you see are just the, the uh, artifacts due to the fact that we, we don't have an infinite comb and we uh, furthermore have a finite bandwidth detection. So. And when we add the qubit, what we see is a slight change of the fluorescence we, we have. So uh, as a mean, uh, you see that it's not exactly the same thing. So what one can uh, do the difference between the two, and what we see is that uh, this, uh, this curious shape with, all, with the wiggles that are due to what I just said before, and uh, the success, successful, that looks like success, uh, successive uh, fix. Um, so uh, how can we understand that? What does the theory say? So uh, the Hamiltonian we send to the qubit is this Hamiltonian. And uh, when you just uh, do the, the master equation uh, of the qubit uh, uh, following this dynamics, when you add dissipation, because we have a very low T1, uh, you see that the qubit experiences uh, successive kicks. And what we see is just, uh, uh, now we can understand the figure we, we, we saw is just each time we have a kick of the qubit, an exponential decay of uh, the sigma x, and again, so uh, this is how the qubit emits into a, a transmission line when there is, uh, when it's driven by a frequency comb. So one can wonder now, um, what happens, I mean, what are the dependence of this fluorescent signal uh, depending on the power we send, the, ampli the Rabi amplitude uh, we send? So, uh, one can do this thing, we just integrate this mean signal over one microsecond, uh, one microsecond and see that the signal becomes more and more uh, strong until it reaches the maximum, then it decreases, it crosses zero, so at some point we don't have any signal left, and then it goes the other way, it becomes positive. And uh, to understand that, one has to, to look at the, 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 the master equation again to see how the qubit, uh, what's the qubit dynamics. Uh, and uh, before that, uh, so uh, before that, we did that to, to actually um, find the optimal uh, drive strength strength of the of the device. So one can wonder what's the optimal uh, what the optimal from the point of view of the of the system. So uh, since the photon number information is encoded in the uh, qubit frequency, uh, one can imagine that. I mean, this is the case actually, that um, to maximize the emission rate, to maximize the information uh, extraction rate, one has to maximize the excited, the, 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 the flow of photons that are emitted by the qubit. And uh, this was indeed proven, uh, I experimentally uh, showed, uh, even if it, it was not with a, a large comb, but by Antoine Essig, uh, uh, by Antoine Essig. Uh, so the gamma dephasing is just the rate at which we lose the information on the face of the storage. So uh, the rate at which we acquire information uh, on the number of photons of the storage, because these are kind of conjugate variables. And we see this maximum for, uh, for uh, pi pulses, actually, that maximizes, uh, I mean, with pi pulses, one uh, determ deterministically emits uh, one photon every one over k, and that's the, the, this way the information leaks, the, in, in this way that the information leaks the most into the environment. But what we are doing is heterodyne measurement. So actually, uh, what we want to maximize is not sigma z, it's sigma x, because uh, when doing pi pulses, we see that just the, the, the sigma x mean value doesn't change and remains zero, so we have actually no, no signal, whereas uh, even if it's the theoretical maximal uh, extraction rate from the cavity. So uh, we, what we want to do is maximize sigma x, and to maximize sigma x, one has to perform um, pi over two uh, pulses. Uh, and now we can understand the curve I showed you, the one I experimentally showed you before. Um, so, uh, this maximum of amplitude is reached for theta equals pi over two. And uh, the minimum of amplitude uh, that, uh, that we uh, attain at a, non at a finite uh, um, uh, drive amplitude is correspond to a theta equals pi, which means that although we extract as uh, much information as we can, we can't retrieve anything from an heterodyne measurement. 
And uh, the inversion of the signal is just the fact that uh, one uh, performs uh, uh, pulses that are more than pi, which means that the, then the, the fluorescence, the decay is on the opposite side of the block sphere. And then uh, it's now in phase with the incoming signals. So we have constructive interferences instead of having destructive ones. Um, so now uh, that we optimize the common amplitude, maybe, okay, this is a spoiler. Okay, yes. Uh, there is still something that I want to optimize, and uh, this is by noticing that we have some dead times. I mean, the qubit has fully the time to relax, which means that half of the time it's almost relaxed and we don't have anything emitted into the transmission line. So to avoid these dead times, the natural solution is just to double uh, the, the frequency spacing of the comb, and to double that, um, uh, one just has to double uh, yeah, the, 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 the frequency for, uh, to double the frequency uh, of the kicks, one just have to, has to double the, the frequency spacing of the comb. Uh, and, but there is an interesting uh, behavior of the qubit uh, when doing so, which is that uh, now the qubit uh, will sometimes be aligned with the comb, so it's the same dynamics as before, but if there is an odd photon, odd number of photons of the, in the storage, sometimes, uh, I mean, one, um, it will alternate between plus pi over two pulses and minus pi over two pulses, but the, the, the strength of the signal at each circle is maximized, so we can e extract information twice as fast, and uh, that's with the, what we did for the following, uh, for, for the end of, the, of this talk. So um, uh, now we want to extract the, the mean signal for each number of photons uh, in the storage, so, uh, so to do so, we displace the storage, we apply a pulse at the frequency that interests us to just post-select. We ask the question, are there three photons, for example? We post-select and we are sure that there are three photons. We take uh, the signal of the emitted by the qubit for 20 microseconds, and then we do another selection afterwards uh, to check that we didn't lose any photon in the process. And uh, by doing so, averaging the signal, one sees that uh, by doubling the frequency of the kicks, one effectively doubles, uh, we, we have uh, the same pattern, but twice as frequent as before. So for zero photons, uh, it works well. Uh, for one photon, odd number, we can see that we have the same thing, but uh, sometimes positive and uh, successfully positive and negative, which uh, confirms uh, the, the theory I just uh, showed you. And we can do that for every number of photons. So we really see this alternance of uh, in-phase kicks and uh, uh, deface uh, kicks for the uh, odd numbers. Um, and now uh, that we have isolated these signals, one can just use these signals to uh, ask the questions we want to, to ask the qubit. So we construct we constructed a demodulation basis out of these sig mean signals so that when demodulating the signal with uh, the, the n functions that we constructed, one has the, the answer for each demodulated signal, are there three photons, or n photons in the general case, which means that um, it will be a bit, a bit clearer afterwards. So uh, we have the photon, the, we, we will have one, um, demodula uh, one demodulation function for every question n equals i that we want to ask for the qubit. So for example, if there are three photons, and that we ask the question, is n equals to, equal to three? So by using the, 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 the function corresponding to n equals three, uh, we have, uh, um, we obtain a Gaussian centered around one, and if there are not three photons, we obtain a Gaussian centered around zero. Um, so xi is the coordinate of the measured signal in the demodulation basis. So we are able to ask all these questions in equal three or n equals four. Uh, until uh, eight and even nine. Uh, I mean, I, I did only for uh, until eight, sorry. Uh, and uh, with an SNR of 2.1 for the, around 2.1 for every odd number and 2.5 for every uh, even number. Uh, the, the difference, uh, you can understand that, uh, is due to uh, the difference of dynamics uh, that we have for, for, for the qubit when there is an odd number or, or an even number of photons. 
So the SNR of each record is written here. You can see uh, this, alterna this alternance of SNRs corresponding to the, the two different dynamics. And um, one can ask, well, one can wonder, that's what we wanted to do. We want to, to, to have a prediction on the number of photons sunk thanks to this setup. Uh, so what is the probability to predict the right number of photons? Uh, and uh, this overall fidelity is plotted here, and it decreases uh, when, one allows, uh, when we allow ourselves to have more photons, because the more measurement record we have, the more questions we ask, the more chances we have to get wrong. And uh, we have this little variation, so you, you, you see that we are, we, we see that we are above 90% uh, with if you just want to dis decide whether we have zero or one photons. And for eight photons, it uh, goes down uh, to 75%, uh, but uh, this is still uh, quite good. I mean, we, we, were, we were still uh, able to, 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 to have a, a quite, uh, to, to have this fidelity. And uh, there, there are still uh, room for improvement because uh, we didn't have the time to optimize every single parameter so we can, for example, play on the frequency of the kicks or that kind of thing. So to conclude, um, we managed to have obtained a, a galvanic connection in 3D uh, with a, a, a Purcell uh, filter on, uh, on chip. Uh, uh, we uh, understood the dynamics of the qubit driven by a frequency cone. And uh, we are kind of single shot uh, with, um, uh, while f continuous photo counting uh, the, 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 the cavity uh, with a narrow probability of 0.25 uh, up to 8 photons and then 0.1 with uh, up to 2 photons. Um, and uh, this is still work in progress. We have to extract the measurement rate of the, of the, of the device. We have an SNR in 20 microseconds, but we want to generalize that. We can improve the SNR with more, more frequent kicks, as I said, and uh, we can perform quantum trajectories, and uh, we would like to do feedback uh, on so if we, um, and we have ideas to make it, uh, to use a machine learning algorithm to perform uh, this feedback. Uh, so with this, I'd like to thank the, the whole team, and in particular, Benjamin Huard or André Bienfray, uh, who are my supervisors and uh, Antoine Essig, who uh, did the previous measurements, uh, designed the, 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 the setup I'm working on uh, right now, uh, and also the, the, the theory team uh, who uh, worked on, the, uh, on these two. And uh, thank you for, for your attention. Okay, uh, do you have some questions? A question, which is maybe a theoretician question. So, as far as I understand, your demodulation basis you obtain experimentally. Yes. So there is, of course, a certain danger that uh, there is already an error on that demodulation function. So my question is like, did you try to to, to kind of get an accurate picture of what's going on theoretically to maybe get uh, more reliable functions? Uh... We, we, we could simulate that uh, and, and try to understand what's the, what's the response, but there are small things that are just relative to the, the, the fact that we have, some, for example, maybe a, a bit of defacing in the lines or attenuation. I mean, maybe the, the qubit is not experiencing a perfect, perfect frequency comb, so uh, this was more straightforward to just look at what the qubit gives us and then use this to, 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 to understand the, to, to just uh, make a sort the information we, we have. Uh, yeah, maybe a, a question along the same line. Can you come back to slide number 36? Yes. Yeah, if we look at the SNR, it seems there is some oscillation. Yes. Odd even, odd even, and I was wondering if it might not be a, a problem with the demodulation I that you're using, or could you explain that? I think that uh, this... Uh, these um, oscillations are not due to the demodulation basis, but rather to the amplitude we use that, has slightly, that is slightly suboptimal. And uh, uh, you, you can understand that uh, with the fact that I think we are a bit uh, too um, under, uh, we, we should drive a bit uh, harder. So 
so, so, so you, you manage to get higher when you are odd on kick kick on the same time than mm -hmm. uh, when uh, doing these alternative kicks. And another question, if I, if I may. Uh, regarding the, the fidelity um, or basically your ability to, to measure in a given amount of time, did you check that uh, this is what you, because you, have a, you said you had a transmon in the, in the cavity to, to also measure the, um, yes, the state uh, of the cavity? Yes, we, we didn't use it yet. Uh, okay. it's, it's to come, we okay. want to, to Good. Yeah. I mean, this is how we would like to extract the true fidelity of our measurement. Yeah, okay, okay, thanks. Yes? <coughs> in which state do you leave the system? after a, a, a time window of 20 microseconds when you have asked your question, is it projective into uh, I have seven photons or I don't have seven photons, or is it projective on a, on a particular fork state? And what will be your strategy for following the quantum trajectories given the, first, the answer to the first question? So uh, what I believe is that uh, in more or less one microseconds, the, the state is fully mixed. Uh, it's a fully mixed state be because we don't recover all the information that is leaked from the qubit. So, so the, the state is projected somewhere, but we don't know yet uh, where. And once uh, we waited 20 microseconds, yes, it's projected uh, into the Fox state that corresponds to, to the more, more or less to the answer we, we got if we had a perfect measurement. Um, and I forgot the second part of your question. Would you follow, like, there, is, there is no strategy for following the quantum. No, it, it, it would be the cartoon gems. At each, at yes. Each 25 microsecond uh, window, we get an edge. Yes. Which is true for sure. Yes, that's it. Um, up to the fidelity of our measurement. So, yeah, the, the quantum trajectory I was talking about is, for example, we populate it with a Korean state and then uh, first measure seven photons and then see the, the jumps uh, every time we lose the photons. Uh, yeah, yeah, that would be our goal. Uh, to save the dead time, you have chosen to take a frequency count at two chi. Yes. Why not three chi? Is uh, it because we, that, that's what I want to improve. Actually, the, the optimum would be four or five chi. I calculated, but uh, this is just uh, recent data, and we still want to improve more. So yes, uh, we could take three chi. Uh, three chi's, and in, the, in, in this case, we would have uh, the, the pulses that are defaced by uh, 2p over 3. Um, but uh, I mean, with the method I presented here, it's not a problem. We could just, uh, uh, I mean, yes, we, we want to try that. Are there any more questions? Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you very much.